said last week that transformation embraces the tension between who we were or who we are and who we're meant to be, right? There, there begins to be this, this stretching of us that happens as we continue and we discover this new thing, and we, we call this the suffering. And this isn't just the, like, a, like an outside suffering. This isn't something that happens to us. It's something that's happening in us. And we said that, that there's this, this point where we no longer believe or see the world the way that we used to, but we're not really sure exactly how we see it. We're not sure exactly what's going on. And there's this tension and there's this stretching, and that is part of the transformation that is necessary for transformation. So we kind of sat in what suffering looks like, that dark night of the soul last week. And, uh, and it got heavy. I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Like we, we didn't just, just gloss over and say everything's going to be better. Just trust more. No, we, we sat in it because I think that's important. And we said that if this stays, it requires devotion. It re- requires of us giving of ourselves where we really want to run and hide. We want to isolate. But instead, if we do the opposite of that, we do the thing that doesn't feel normal, the thing that doesn't feel natural, we give of ourselves, it actually enhances that process and pushes us through this process. And if we keep going, we find ourselves somewhere completely new. Here, delight, serenity. Hey, have you ever seen like a baby? You ever seen a baby? Okay, good. Just checking if y'all are awake. Have you ever played like with a baby? Like some of you are like, no, they scare me to death, right? But have you ever played with a baby? And like, like there's this, this, this baby that, like, literally, the world is all brand new, right? They're new. And there's just something fun about a baby, a child at play, discovering something new, living in their newness, seeing the world like they've never seen it before because they have never seen it before. And there's something that's beautiful about that, and it brings joy to the people that are interacting and playing with the child, with the baby, right? And it's why, it's why the, the baby giggling videos are so wonderful. Like, if you had a bad day, you just go on YouTube and click on videos of babies giggling, right? Because it brings us joy because we see this, this pure, unadulterated, this non-judgmental, this non-critical joy and delight in this baby. And that is what we experience here. Okay? If we move through the suffering, we, move, we, don't, we don't just ignore it, we don't reject it, we participate in it, right? we embrace it, we recognize it, and we push through, we get to this place of delight, this place of joy. We begin to see the place where we belong, and our idea worth discussing today is simply this. We're going to keep going a little bit, a little bit more, one more, one more. There we go. Transformation leads us into new experiences through the most unusual circumstances. This is something that about this part of the path that I love and that, that I'll say this, I, I've experienced most recently, is, is in the places that you would never have imagined, in the situations you would have never guessed, life becomes new and things become opened up like never before through the most unusual people and places and, and circumstances. And when newness really hits and you begin to open yourself up to this newness, wow, the joy is unbelievable because you begin to see it everywhere and in everything. And that is when we begin to be in that sweet spot, right? The serenity, the peace, the presence that we have in that. And the key to experiencing delight is opening ourselves up to the experience of life, seeing life and living it to the fullest. So we've been in our story on Joseph. Um, starting off, we, we looked at Joseph in Genesis 37. You look at this. I'm kind of like giving an overview because these are a lot of chapters to read. But Joseph was this young man, and, uh, and he was the, the youngest in his family. And uh, his family uh, didn't really like him, especially his brothers. He was kind of a tattletale, we find out. And his, and his father favored him. And so we see that this caused some real turmoil in his family. And so to make matters worse, Joseph had these dreams. And these dreams were basically interpreted that, that his family was going to bow down to him as like their ruler. 
Right? So this, obviously, if you have brothers that already don't like you because you're favored by your father and you're a tattletale, telling them that one day they're going to bow down to you as some ruler um, doesn't really sit well, right? So, so this causes even more problems. And, once, and, and we, the story continues that, that his brothers go to this place. They're, they're feeding their sheep. They're doing business. And his dad wants to send jo- uh, Joseph out to come back and report back as to how his brothers are doing, if they need anything, what's going on. And so Joseph goes out, he, he leaves, and his job was to report back, but he would never, ever come back because as, as he comes over the horizon, his brothers recognize this coat that his father had given him that made him like look and feel more special. There was this identity in this coat as the favored child. And so they recognize this coat, they see him, and they plot, let's kill him. Well, the older brother, right, and if you're an oldest child here, you know, you're just the, the smart one, the level-headed one in the family, right, the, the practical one. And so the older brother was like, listen, we probably shouldn't kill him, right? Let's just throw him in this pit, and then he'll die on his own, right? There was like a well there that was empty, and they were just going to throw him in there. And really, in his mind, he was going to come back and rescue him, okay? So they're like, okay, let's do that. And so they throw him in this pit. And then the older brother leaves again, going to do business, and the brothers are sitting there, and they're like, you know what? Like, this just seems pointless. Like, we're not getting anything from this. And so they decide to sell Joseph into slavery as these traders pass by, right? And so they they literally sell their youngest brother, and maybe you've wanted to do that. They sell their youngest brother to these slave traders. And they're like, we make money off of it. Reuben gets back, the oldest brother, and, he, and he's furious. And so they figure out a plan. They're going to trick their father. They're going to say that he was uh, mauled along the way. And they take his coat, right, this identity, this thing that was his, and they covered in sheep's blood. Uh, they didn't have DNA testing back then, so the father believes what they tell him, that we found this on the way, and he must have been mauled and killed by an animal. But Joseph really is being sold into slavery. And so these Ishmaelite traders, which the Ishmaelites, that, that, that was a, a people that would have hated Joseph's family, known as the Israelites. And so they take him and they sell him to uh, an Egyptian captain of the guards, or someone who was pretty high up in the military. And, and Joseph actually goes into this, and, and he excels. He excels as a slave, right? He becomes this wonderful manager of all the things that this man Potiphar has. And he's a good-looking guy. He's about 17, 18, 19 years old around this time. And, and Potiphar's wife was like, you know, she began to hit on him. And, and then she, she kind of threw herself at him and propositioned him, and he said no. And, and it's very interesting. He had been given this new coat by Potiphar, right, that, that, that he was number two in the house, and, and he was this well-respected like, slave and chief servant. And, and as he runs away saying, I'm not going to do that, she takes his coat off of him and is able to tear it off of him. And that, again, that coat is how, that identity is how she, hey, listen, he tried to rape me. And look, and look, this is his. And I can't believe you brought this, this Hebrew into our house. And, and she associates him again with this thing that he is no longer, right? He's not with his family. His family got rid of him. And he's not what he's going to be. And he's in this transition. And we said this was part of the suffering. And he ends up in prison. And then that's where we're going to pick up the story today is of Joseph in prison. So we have, he, he's in the pit, and he's in Potiphar's house, and then now he's in the prison. And, and what he does is he begins to leverage, again, his, his management skills and becomes kind of like one of the, the like head prisoners, you know? And like he's kind of helping the, the, the guards and kind of running the thing and managing the prison, and, and he becomes well-liked, and we see that everything he does kind of just is, is good, and, and he does well. And, and he's in there, and there's these two new inmates that come in. And the, the, the Pharaoh, the king, has thrown them into the prison because uh, of kind of a, a misunderstanding with one and, and truth with the other, right? And he feels like they're, they're trying to kill me. They're plotting to kill me. He's paranoid, throws them in. And while in prison, these two different guys uh, have dreams. One of them's a baker, and one of them was like the, the king's cupbearer. Basically, he tasted the food in case someone had poisoned it. He would die instead of the king. Wouldn't you like to have one of those? That's kind of neat. So that's, that's their jobs, and, and, and they have these dreams, and remember Joseph, he had dreams too, and he kind of figured out what those dreams meant, and so he said, hey, I'll, I'll help you understand your dreams, and basically it was like one of you is going to be vindicated, and the other one's going to be killed, and so that's exactly what happened, and, and the one that was vindicated, Joseph said, hey, when you get out, like, just mention me to the king, right? Like, I've been nice to you, I helped you out in here, like, would you just mention me to the Pharaoh, right? Trying to, to leverage that relationship and what he had done for this guy. Well, a few years passes, and uh, 
nothing, right? Like the guy's like, okay, yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> you ever had somebody in your life, yeah, 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 I'll mention that to the boss, and then nothing, right? And so, so a few, few years goes by, and then the Pharaoh begins to have dreams. And he has this disturbing dream, that, and it's different dreams, and they, they seem to kind of correlate and, and have some of the same symbolism. And so he calls in his council, his, his wise people, and the people that would help him with this, and none of them can do it. And the cupbearer, who's like there, right next to him, all along the way, is like, oh, yeah, there's this guy, Joseph. And he helped me with my dream, and he helped the other guy with his dream, but he died. Remember when this happened, Pharaoh? Remember when you did that to us, and, and that was kind of all figured out? Well, like, Joseph helped us. I think he could help you. So Pharaoh calls in Joseph, and he says, hey, I need your help. Here's my dream. And Joseph does something that's very interesting. He says, listen, I'm not able to help you out, but I think God is. He's like, this doesn't come from me. This this understanding, this wisdom that I have is from God. And so Pharaoh's like, okay, and he he believed in many gods, so this wasn't like a a far-fetched thing that that this guy had this access to this God that would help him with these things. And so he tells him his dreams, and Joseph helps figure it out. And then this is what happens. It's so interesting. Let's look at what happens with Joseph. It says, Joseph's suggestion were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. Here were Joseph's suggestions. The, the dreams basically meant this. You're going to go through seven years of plenty and then seven years of famine. You need to prepare during the seven years of plenty for the seven years of famine. If you do that, you and your, your country and, and, and Egypt, the civilization, and beyond can survive because you're going to have seven years of plenty and seven years of famine. If you do this, you will survive. You store it up. If you do everything you can, you enact this plan nationwide. It'll happen. So that was, that was his plan. The suggestions were well received. So Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the spirit of God? Now, again, I don't know that he would necessarily believe in this God, trust this God, understood this God the way that Joseph did, but he understood one thing. Clearly, something is different about this person. So can we find anyone else? Hypothetical question. No. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, Clearly no one else is intelli- as intelligent or wise as you are. That would be nice to hear from the king, right? You will be in charge of my court, and all my people will take orders from you. Only I, sitting on my throne, will have the rank higher than yours. This guy goes from the pit to a slave in Potiphar's house to prison to number two in the civilization of the day. The Empire, the power of the day, the greatest civilization of that time, he is now number two in the whole thing. It's pretty exciting to to think about what can happen when we embrace, recognize, and participate in the process of transformation. I want you to think about your, your life and, and how you, how you ha- would handle this, right? And, and how this has maybe even happened in your life. At 30 years old, Genesis tells us, the author of Genesis tells us, at 30 years old, he is made number two, the greatest civilization of the time. He's actually given a new name, which is interesting because names were incredibly important in ancient civilizations. They were kind of an identity that was placed on you. And he was given a new name that I can't pronounce, but most people, most scholars agree that translated it means God speaks and lives. So his new identity that he's given from this king that is outside, right? This guy doesn't believe in the same God that Joseph and his family believed in. But he recognized something. His God's real. He has a connection with it. And in him, God speaks and lives. Wow. A new identity. So, I want to help us today to understand this path a little bit more. To to gather some thoughts so we can discuss this well. And I want to encourage you in a few things today that I think are going to be hugely important. Now, first thought on finding our place like Joseph did. Opportunities to be who we are. Are meant to, or who we are meant to be, can be found anywhere at any time through anyone. The opportunity to be who we're meant to be can be found any place at any time through anyone. This is important to understand. Do you think Joseph, if he had these dreams as a young man that he was going to be a ruler, do you think this is the path he would have taken? Right? No. Do you think he would have even imagined that it wasn't just ruling over his family, but it was ruling over the greatest civilization of the time? Probably not. 
And it happened through being sold into slavery, right? And a, a captain of the Egyptian guard and, and being falsely accused of rape and, and being imprisoned. This is how it happened. Our journey is, doesn't always happen the way we want it to be, but if we embrace it and participate in it, imagine what happens. Look at this quote from Alexander Shia, who writes about these, this fourfold path, and he's a wonderful author in his book, Heart and Mind. I highly recommend it. He uses the four Gospels to go through this fourfold path and journey of transformation. He says, if we are not fully present, not open to possibility, we will be unlikely to hear our true name. Remember that, that identity, that true identity when it is called. You see, a lot of times we want to shut ourselves off because, because and here's the, here's the fact, this thing is not going to be like where you were over here before you started in the past, right? This thing is new. This thing is a new identity. It's a new place in the world. It's a new way of seeing things. And so it's not what it was. And so sometimes we can be tempted to close ourselves off to this new thing, to this new life, and to enjoying this new thing and, and the transformation that is happening. But if we open ourselves up and we are fully present with the people and the places around us, and this is an attitude shift, this is intentional, if we are fully open, we begin to see who we are meant to be and we begin to delight in the process and the spiritual transformation that is going on in our life. So we continue. Leveraging one thing to lead to another creates more opportunity for joy. See, sometimes we get stuck in these things that aren't the thing that we want to be, right? We feel stuck. And rather than leveraging the relationships that we have or the thing that we know or the thing that we can do or the thing we have experienced, we kind of will just sit in it and not really move, right? We get stuck. And I think human beings are just prone to getting stuck. But if we can leverage one thing to lead to another, it expands the opportunities to receive joy in our life and to see newness and to see new things like we've never seen before before. Leveraging what we know now for what can be by the greater opportunities for joy. And then lastly, we saw this. Others begin to see the effects of God through us when we simply become who God created us to be. I love that Pharaoh was like, yeah, this is a God thing. And all Joseph was doing was what he was meant to do. He was just accepting it. He was just participating in it. He was giving himself over to this process. He's like, hey, this is what I'm good at. I'm good at managing things, and I have wisdom. When it comes to understanding what's going on in people's life, I have discernment. And he used that. And what people saw was God, which is why in this part of the path, and we, we connected it to our various core values, right? We said that at the beginning, you've got to commit yourself to this new thing, and then you give generously of yourself over here in devotion, and then down here, you worship wholeheartedly, and here's what we mean by that. Worship is simply this. It's not standing and singing songs at church. That is, that is an unintentional lie that the church has perpetuated. It's, that's not what worship is. Worship is merely reflecting back to God and to everyone else who God is. It's just living a life fully present to the presence of God and the presence of others in our life. That's what it means to live, to worship wholeheartedly. It's just living your life for God and letting everyone else see it. He didn't have to preach to them. He didn't have to convince them. He didn't have to throw a sales pitch to them. When they looked at his life, they said, this guy is in touch with God. Think about your own life. Are you loving and living in a way that people can look at you and go, man, this, this woman, this man is connected to God. I don't understand it. I can't articulate it. I'm not going to understand it completely. But there is something about the way this person lives and loves. And the peace that they live their life in. And we know these are all byproducts. We looked at it the first week. These are products of living and embracing the spiritual transformation. When others see the effects of God in our life. They can't help but recognize what's going on. And so, some thoughts on this, on this stage, right? As we're in this stage, we, we've, every week we've looked at these four things. So the, the question and answer is, how do we experience delight? How do you experience delight? How do we experience delight, right? What's that place, and how do we understand? We see for, for, for Joseph, I mean, he was pulled out of prison and made number two. That was quite a jump, 
right? And, and he had to ask himself, how do I, how do I experience delight in this? The danger in staying. Complacency and comfortability. Complacency and comfortability. Like, wait, wait, comfortability is a good thing. Sure, it might be nice to be comfortable, but here's the thing. If we stay here, we become very self-serving if we stay here too long. This is a good place to be. You want to be in this place, but you can become very self-serving. You can become comfortable. And a lot of you know people like that. You know the religious people that they're dug into what they believe and the way they view the world. And they're not budging because they found it at some point. It worked for them. And And they may see it crumbling around them, but they're dug in. Can't stay here too long, but I want to encourage you. If you're here, like live it up. <laughs> like enjoy it. It's a great place to be. We just don't want to get stuck there. Or else we get comfortable. We get dug in. And we don't continue to transform. Spiritual disciplines, God time. God time. A sacred pathway. There's a great book called Sacred Pathways that talks about like nine different ways that people experience God. And experience joy in their relationship with God through Jesus. And again, for some of you, it may be in nature, right? At a hike, at the beach. It's just experiencing the, the beauty of nature connects you with God. That's awesome. Take time to do that. For others, it's, it's being in a place with stained glass and, and beautiful architecture. Or looking at, 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 at art that connects you with God. That's awesome. For others, it's, it's being in the Word of God and learning about God's character through what He says in the Bible. And for others, it's being here on a Sunday, right? And like, like, like experiencing the discussion and seeing God in other people. And, and there's all kinds of ways to experience God. I would, say, I would say really, really lean into that way that you experience God. Find it. Find that way that you delight in God and live it up and make that a discipline in your life. And I'm not going to miss it. I wrote a blog post this week about the health benefit of being at gatherings in a religious or faith-based community. There is something healthy about it. Find that discipline and enjoy it. Delight. And then, as we said, our core value here is wholehearted worship. Wholehearted worship. Now, we always want to connect this to Jesus. So I want us to look at what this guy Paul said, who wrote most of the New Testament, started a lot of churches doing what we're doing here Right? And he said this in his letter to the churches at Philippi, and and this is so powerful. This is so powerful. He began to see something in his life, in the life of Jesus. He said, I want to know Christ. And this this know is that is that intimate understanding and knowledge. If you look at it in its its root word in the Greek, is this this idea of this intimate understanding. I want to know Christ. I want to experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. Because to the earliest of early Christians, to the earliest people that followed Jesus, the thing that connected them, the faith that was the anchor, or excuse me, the thing that was the anchor of their faith was this belief that Jesus raised from the dead. And it wasn't so far-fetched because they knew people who had seen him, or they had seen him raised from the dead themselves. And so this wasn't some wild outlandish story that they had, you know, that they just believed out of nowhere. No, they knew people that were telling them the story. We find that over 500 people that saw this, and Paul is connecting this to his life. He said, the power that raises that I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death. This word also says uh, the, it can be translated participating, partnering in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. That's what this stage is. This is new life. This is resurrection. Jesus had to die to be resurrected, right? It's part of the process. And it's part of the process in our life as well. This renewal, this new birth, this resurrection. Recognizing it and embracing it. Look at Father Richard Rohr says this. We were meant to thrive, not just survive. We are glad when someone survives, and that surely took some courage and effort. But what are you going to do with your now resurrected life? That is the heroic question. That's really my question for you today. If you're like, yeah, man, spiritually, there's this new thing going on. I don't understand it. I can't put my finger on it. I'm excited about it. There's a, there's a new life that's going on inside of me. I'm going to ask you, what are you going to do with it? What are you going to do with it? 
Are you going to live open and fully present to all the things that you've never imagined that God could be speaking to you, that you could be transforming through? Because remember, our idea worth discussing is transformation leads us into new experiences through the most unusual circumstances. With that resurrected life, I would say this, live it open and present to what's going on around you.